on a mission, on a quest, on a search for discovering the truth. Join us on our journey to discovering a savior. All right, welcome to your church friends podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Mirlich. So, do you have any stories where you were around something that was maybe like someone prophesied or maybe prophesied specifically about you? So there's a couple different ways to go with this. <laughs> I, I guess it will maybe tie into what we're going to talk about later. Um, one of them is when I was in Bible school and one of the professors, I don't know what it was about like him to me, but mm-hmm. he would always just like, I guess you would call this like prophesying over me. He's like, you are the golden mouthpiece of God. Wow. Yeah. And he would yeah. do that all the time in his prayers. And that's just like, so it wasn't like a telling of the future. Or mm-hmm. maybe it was because here we are on the podcast as the golden mouthpiece of God. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it from then. I think we need a new logo. It's just like the golden mouthpiece. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It'll be a grill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, there was that. And just like really kind of speaking into, you know, God using me in that way. Yeah. So it wasn't anything particular like, oh, in this date and time or here's mm-hmm. how this thing's going to play out. So that was more on like the positive aspect from like a Christian point of view. But I remember before I came uh, into the church when I was down living in Huntington Beach, and I don't even know what drove me to do it, but I looked online about like um, going and seeing like a fortune teller. Mm. And it was really interesting to go because she just did it out of her house. Was she in indoor? No, she was indoor. <laughs> she was indoor. <laughs> yeah, indoor. yeah, she was in her house. <laughs> um, stupid. Uh, First Samuel reference. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking about teddy bears. Yeah. <laughs> the Ewoks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, anyways, I went, and I was just like, oh, I'll check it out, see, because I'm, I was always interested. Yeah, th- is there something to any of this? Mm-hmm. And she's going, and one of the things that was interesting is she did say, because I had a bunch of health problems when I was young, and she did say that something of that would come back. And this has been maybe 16 years ago now, but always in the back of my mind, I'm like, is something going to come oh, back? Oh, yeah. Which the only reason why I'm giving that any credence is because she said about the person that I was going to end up with as far as in a relationship. And she started describing this girl. And I was dating someone at the time. Did not describe her at all. Perfectly describes Delilah. Oh. And like crazy. That wasn't until a few years later. Just personality wise and everything. Like just so much about who Delilah is was foretold by the fortune teller so i'm like all right well if you got delilah right like i'm gonna end up in the er at some point like (laughs) that that health stuff is coming back yeah also you know praying against that you know yeah yeah uh, yeah definitely definitely Uh, especially since it was fortune teller but i mean that's weird because we've seen it in the the bible right like there's that girl who's fortune telling in acts Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly going back to the king saul reference in first samuel that he went to the witch of endor for fortune telling and kind of pulling out speaking to the dead yeah uh that you know there might be something more to it than we just kind of like fluff away i think a bunch of it is scams but i do think that there is something that can be tapped yeah, speaking into. of scams uh so <laughs> this is your prophecy <laughs> this is my prophecy uh, <laughs> when i was probably late teens early 20s i went with a friend to a spanish church i, I don't speak spanish um so I, I sat through most of it and you know uh he helped me kind of, he interpreted some of the things. Uh, but then um, as most kind of Hispanic churches are, they're very charismatic. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was that end time of worship and speaking in tongues. And this part is not abnormal to me. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, so I'm kind of used to what's happening. But then someone came up to me and they were like, I'm, I, I need to pray for you. And I was like, cool. And so they started praying for me, and then they're like, I need you to understand this. Um, I know what you're going through. Uh, you have issues with your parents. and Your dad's right next to you? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Was a and I was kind of like, well, yeah. And he was like, you need to forgive them. And I was like, okay. And he was like, this is what's going to stop you from moving forward. And it was just this weird thing. He was like, and your dad, specifically your dad. Uh, so it was this weird thing and I was like, okay. And I kind of got in the car and then I seen him like do the same kind of spiel to other people who looked around my age and I heard the same thing. Mm. 
And I was like, oh, that that was I mean, it's 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 like we were talking about like the the tele television people, mediums were like, um, someone in here, I'm getting like a Steven, is there a Steven? Or did you know a Steven? Oh yeah, I it's such a common name. I mean, even at our church, we have like 40 of them. Yeah. They're like, oh, and then this is going on. Like you kind of are able to hit these targets blindly. And I felt like that's what happened with me. It was just like, I'm a Hispanic guy who is a teenager. Most teenagers <laughs> are in like relationship issues with their parents. Mm -hmm. Like it's that rebellious time. You're, uh, you're going through hormone changes and everything. And I mean, most of us at teenage age felt like we knew better than our parents anyway. So like it was just so vague. And then the fact that he went around and told everyone else, I felt less special. It's more about that. Yeah, it was more about that. So, <laughs> like, so then I didn't forgive my dad. <laughs> so I didn't, and then we moved on. Uh, but you know, it, it's just it was weird. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it always makes me think, especially when you get into like open settings of people kind of saying things. I mean, even online nowadays, of people like prophesying about what's happening, especially with all the craziness that is happening in our world today. No, it just made me think. Oh man, I forget how the meme worded it, but it was just like. If you ever want to feel better about yourself, just go ask any of those online prophets what their predictions were for the end of 2020. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, At the beginning of 2020 when they did the prophecy. Yeah, they yeah. said a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all this stuff that kind of attacks us as far as like what's prophecy and people prophesying. It does make it hard to say like, how can I trust prophecy? Yeah. Just look at what we said. Like, am I going to be the golden mouthpiece? Yeah. <laughs> I did get married. Will I get sick? Yeah. Will you ever forgive your father? <laughs> <laughs> Find out next week. Yeah. If it's ever a real prophecy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and I did. Uh, but it was mainly for him always eating my food that I left inside of the refrigerator. I'm more so just laughing because I think your dad listens sometimes. So hi, dad. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's crazy. And it does do that. And with like so much prophecy that goes on in the Bible and some of it being uh, prophetic for future events, some of it being prophetic for like things that are happening, and some of it even being prophetic for things that have yet to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does put the question, I think, in a lot of people's minds of, can I trust this? Yeah, and I think that to go back to biblical times, it was a, a bit more stringent, because, you know, if somebody mm -hmm. said something and didn't come to pass, you would just kill them. Yeah. So if you didn't really have Miss Cleo out there. <laughs> just like, For yeah, let me tell everybody a bunch of stuff. I'm not even Jamaican, yeah. like, you know, yeah. whatever that is. And uh, so I do think that things were a bit more serious. But then, yeah, it wasn't just unique to the Bible. You had prophets and prophecies going on from all kinds of ancient civilizations. Mm -hmm. Not just only ancient, I and mean, it's still going on today, but definitely it's, defi it's, it's a part of humanity that goes very far back. It's definitely a part of our faith that's foundational as we're on this thing of like discovering a savior. It's just like prophecy just super comes into that whole thing. So it's something that we need to look at. But as we're talking about, how, how do you trust it? So I, I want to take us to a passage where I feel like there was a prophecy and the guy was like, how do I trust this? Uh, so I'm, I'm specifically thinking of uh, the prophecy of John the Baptist to his dad, Zachariah. Okay. And where Gabriel came in. So this one's told in the Gospel of Luke, um, which is cool. One of the things I did find when looking at the Gospel of Luke in whole uh, is that Jesus' name doesn't occur for the first 30 verses at all. And I thought that was kind of cool and interesting. That's nothing to do with our show other than I like sometimes random facts about the Bible because they're cool and weird. But they're also, if you're looking at the, like how a book is written, there's mm -hmm. like there's purpose behind this. Uh, but it does begin with the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, they're a devout couple uh, living everyday life. Uh, and it begins with in the times of King Herod, uh, who was king over Judah. So that right there kind of gives us the shaping of uh, the time frame. You know, like what what is going on during that time? I'm just making a face because my memory... We did an episode on Herod, right? We did. So yeah, if you villains. want more on that guy, go back to the villains and you can uh, learn about Herod. Yeah, we did a Herod on, uh, episode on Herod, Herod, and Herod. Yeah. yeah. The Herodians. <laughs> the Herodians, yes. Uh, that long line. So th during this time, though, it wasn't the best. Uh, and the people haven't heard a prophetic word from God in 400 years. There was 400 years of silence. 
Uh, the last thing they had was that Italian prophet Malici, yeah, or Malachi, uh, and these are the last words of the Old Testament. So I'm going to just read them. It said, "Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse." And this is the Old Testament, and uh, 400 years have gone by. And you're in a time where, like, the spiritual leaders are shackled by traditions and corruption. And like we said, we went over King Herod. He was awful. Uh, he had, I think we covered this, but I'm just going to say it again. He had nine wives, uh, one of them that he had executed for, like, no reason at all. Sounds so, about right. Yeah. This is this dude. So it's dark days, and we have two devout, obedient believers and followers, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Before we get to them, I want to, because like, yeah, 400 years of silence, right? If you've mm -hmm. been around church, like, you know that that's kind of, well, what happened between the Testaments? Yeah. So like, that's generally how it's termed. I don't know how silent it was. Like, I wonder just kind of how you were saying, like, dude, running around the church, like, oh, I have a word for you, mm -hmm. like, for you and all that stuff. I wonder during that how much chatter there actually was. Yeah. Going back to, like, how can you trust the prophecy? Because, like, it's an argument from silence. We don't know what was or wasn't being said. I know there's different historical stuff, but, like, I wonder... Like, a, a, tr a true word of God hadn't come. But I wonder how many people were running around saying stuff. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. which then, as I'm just trying to frame what we're getting into with these. I mean, obviously, like, there had to be something going on with even the Maccabees yeah, to, yeah. to rise up and feel like we can, we can do this. So, yeah, there had to be something, but nothing, like you said. I like the way you phrased that. No true word from God had yet come yet. So, yeah. Uh, so, all that stuff's happening. Silence, some silence, no silence, maybe silence. Uh, and then there's Zechariah and Elizabeth um, observing all of the Lord's commandments and uh, regulations, and they were doing it blamelessly. Like, th this is what you read in Luke's story when he talks about them. They were just doing it blamelessly. Um, so I, I want to get into, like, the baby name game again. Oh, I didn't prepare that. You didn't? No. Oh, that's okay. So I got. I need to start doing that again. You do. It's so fun. I started this game. <laughs> you did, and I'm gonna. I'll pick it up for this one. You could take it on for the next one. Uh, Zachariah means Jehovah has redeemed, and Elizabeth means my God is an oath. And I really thought those names were super cool. The meanings where you're looking at Zachariah, who is getting ready to be uh, the father of John the Baptist, that Elijah that's supposed to come before, and his name is Jehovah redeems, like. God is about to redeem all people. And then Elizabeth, my God, is an oath. Like he is a promise. He is a word, something that is solid, right? It's just like whatever said is going to be done. Uh, and I thought those were really two cool names. But we have Zechariah. He belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Abijah, yeah. Yep. Uh, and he, you can find more about him in First Chronicles uh, 24. But that naming in there, it's, it's triggering back to that. Like, go back to First Chronicles chapter uh, 24. Uh, and then it also mentions that Elizabeth uh, being barren, um, and this is to re remind us as readers of how difficult things were for her in her culture, where like a childless woman would be mocked. So it's not just throwing it out there to like say she didn't have kids. It was like also telling us of how difficult she had it. Yeah, and again, I, look through all of the scriptures to be mm -hmm. childless was just always a hard time. Right. And I think it's, it's a big thing when you're going into, again, being how devoted she was to God. Um, that even in the midst of being mocked, ridiculed, and kind of living through this personal trial, she never wavered. And I feel like sometimes this is probably a side note, not much to what we're grand scheme of things. But I, I really want to touch on her faithfulness to God. Because a lot of us can give up on God when things aren't going our way. Hmm. Yeah, I was kind of taking that another way of sometimes we might think that people aren't faithful because we're not seeing what should be the blessings mm -hmm. of faithfulness. You know, why doesn't she have kids? Is she really that faithful? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So both ways there. Uh, Luke moves the story forward. So he, that, he gives us the introduction of who they are. Uh, he moves it forward with the word once. Um, so it's like once there was this time where uh, Zechariah's division was on duty. And so this is verses 8 and 9. And this was a special thing for Zechariah. It really was a once-in-a-lifetime thing that he got chosen to go into the temple or into, yeah, into the temple, right? Yeah. And just to even set that frame of like him being chosen, chosen by lots. Mm -hmm. So, right, it's kind of like luck of the draw type thing. 
Like, okay, here's all the priests, so then they're going to cast lots, and then this is how Zechariah gets chosen, which I want to bring that out because just as we progress into the story, how it all comes together, uh, things that might seem by chance or how are things happening, but God orchestrating through those things even. Because yeah. you think, oh, it's a once in a lifetime. It's just like, it wasn't even like, oh, it's your turn now, or you had somebody singling them out. It's just like, no, it's being cast by lots, which, again, go back into the Old Testament. That's often how many divine things were decided mm-hmm. was by lot. So yeah, definitely something going on there. But Zachariah gets picked. I mean, the one that comes to my mind almost instantly whenever I read uh, Cast Lots is Jonah. Yeah. Like <laughs> Toss that, him over. <laughs> who, who, who done made God mad? And they're like, well, he got, were they doing like short sticks too? Or how were they casting lots? Do you know? I don't know. I know there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. One of them is like a stick type thing. Another one is like mm-hmm. you toss something, but. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's like he got it and tossed overboard. Sorry, I know we're going sidetrack, sidetrack. But it's just hilarious to me that Jonah knows that he's going against God. <laughs> but he's also sitting there like, someone else might have pissed off their God more. <laughs> like, he's not fessing yeah, up. Yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. Y'all cast lots. If it ain't me, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> I'm not turning myself in unless I have to. I ain't snitching yeah. on me. I like that you brought up, though, that the, the whole idea of like God orchestrating thing. Uh, and I read this in a commentary, and I thought it was super cool. It says, sometimes we can miss God's divine hand on things. It wasn't luck or coincidence that Zachariah was chosen mm-hmm. that day to go in the temple. It was a God divine appointment. Yeah. So again, as we're looking at like prophecy and things happening, like... There, there's God always orchestrating and moving things when we're not looking. And I think it's also important to notice how God often speaks to his people or calls them while they're just doing stuff. Doing stuff, yeah. I thought that was so cool. I never put this parallel together um, in that until I really started looking into like what we we're going to talk about. Uh, so like Moses and David were just taking care of sheep, just doing their everyday Moses, life. Moses is just out there killing Egyptians. Yeah. Well, when, when he was in <laughs> no. the bush thing, yeah. Uh, Gideon was just out in the threshing, you know, out there threshing wheat. Peter was just fishing. And there's these divine interventions of, like, God coming in and changing the trajectory of their lives. And uh, Zachariah was the same thing. He was just regularly going about his business. Uh, I feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves in the story. Slightly, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean? What's being projected? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he right writes this just on that point. He says, sometimes regular duty provides the context for extraordinary visions. And then Warren Wiersbe said, uh, it is difficult to steer a car when the engine is not running. We get busy. God starts to direct us. And I really like that one. When we get busy, God starts to direct us. And I think, yeah, we just, just start moving. Anyways, uh, and angels are then mentioned. So we get into Luke where like the angel shows up in, in it. And again, just another like useless fact, but angels are mentioned uh, 23 times in Luke. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Zachariah responds. So Gabriel shows up and uh, is standing there. Actually, let me read it because yeah. I think that's going to put the picture better. So it's 11. Uh, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So again, he's by the altar. Uh, when Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your, uh, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will give him the name John. So uh, Gabriel's response is, I think, completely normal. I never really noticed this. I think it wasn't until uh, we were covering Enoch mm-hmm. and um, the angels appearing. And, like, you know, I think it was uh, to Noah's father when he showed up to tell him, like, no, everything's cool. It was one of those things, but like, just that uh, the response of a person sometimes like when an angel shows up or the message they deliver it's like yeah if an angel just popped up i probably would be filled with fear as well um and i think it's because like for the most part when an angel did show up it was like yeah this it's not a good thing that's gonna happen right sorry you said gabriel's response was right so i was trying to listen yeah Yeah, zechariah Zechariah. yeah yeah so yeah just to to frame Mm -hmm. that post is that yeah zechariah's response Gabriel pops up, he's an angel that's yeah. there, and is just, like, terrified. I think that when you look into the original wording there, too, where it's like, oh, he was startled. Mm-hmm. And then fear gripped him. It's like, startled is a very weak word. It's kind of like when uh, Jesus is fasting for 40 days, and he goes, and then he became hungry. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, no. Like, yeah. the hungry that he had was, like, his muscles were eating themselves at that point. It's like, that's, you know, so that's kind of the same thing. Like, oh, then he got startled. Like, oh, what are you doing in here? It's like, no, it's the realization of... Here is a divine being yeah. that's here. This can't, like, uh-oh. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. what you're saying. Yeah, and I mean, just thinking about when divine beings showed up, it was usually like pronouncement of judgment. Like it was, here's what's going to happen. Or I, I just think the angel of the Lord was always like the Egypt thing, right? Angel of the Lord came in and swept through Egypt and there was that. So yeah, what what's going to be said or what's going to happen to me? I don't even need to take it to, oh, he's going to bring judgment. I just bring it to like, there's a divine being. Yeah. Here. Like I, I'm... I'm I'm just me, and that that ain't enough right now. Right. Uh, So Gabriel gives the most gracious statement, I think, of in the Bible is do not be afraid. Um, And it's repeated over and over throughout the Bible. It's do not be afraid, do not be afraid. I'm guessing you said, what, 23 mentions of angels? Yeah. This isn't accurate, but I would say probably 23 mentions of do not be afraid. Right. (laughs) It seems like any time they pop up, it's like, yo, calm down, it's all right. right. Uh, So then with the... Prophetic message, he he says, your prayers have been answered, and uh, you'll have a son, and you'll name him John. So this is kind of what we're getting into, is this like prophetic message of like, hey, you're going to have a son. You've been praying for this. Um, we've heard your prayers. And, and that's th- that portion right there I, I really love is um, your prayers have been heard. Mm-hmm. And, and I think for us sometimes as we pray, just again, a little side note, there's so much content in this passage and in this story that it's just kind of hard not to pull some of these little nuggets. But like, I, I think sometimes we pray and we're not hearing or seeing anything and we don't feel heard. And I know for myself personally, that does create distance and separation from God if I don't feel heard. Um, imagine having a conversation with someone and you're like, they didn't hear a word I said. And we've all been there and we know how that feels. Uh, Murdoch's laughing because he feels like I've done that to him a few times. Oh, not just laughing about like, is that what's happening right now? You feel like <laughs> Murdoch just think about what he's going to yeah. say next. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but with all that, uh, it's going to be John. Uh, baby name game. John means Jehovah is gracious. So we have that there. Uh, but it's just cool that little did Zachariah know that God would answer his and Elizabeth's prayers and give them uh, not just a priest that would follow as he would, but a prophet. Um, but you keep getting ahead of... You didn't read those verses yet. Uh, read them. Read them. All right. So, uh, have a son you'll name John. You have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So yeah, not just a priest because yeah, dad's a priest. You're getting born into Mm -hmm. that. Here's a priest is like, oh man, being prophesied over is like, you're going to have this son. But like, no, 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 it's going beyond. We heard your prayers. It's like, here's the son that you're going to have. He's going to be great before the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Like, how's it word? He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think that when you're looking at the Old Testament, it's like, who would you say embodies prophet the most generally? Like, who yeah. gets kind of uh, typified? Elijah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's something you said, and it triggered something. Let me think. What did you just say again? Speaking of not listening when you're talking. I hope you keep that in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just read the verses. Got it. Going back to the, he heard your prayers. And when you're talking about uh, propheticness, like the, he heard your prayers, Zechariah, and your wife's prayers, God's, God's heard them. Uh, what's crazy about John's prophetic uh, birth announcement is that it wasn't just that he heard their prayers. He heard Israel's prayers, Mm. right? Like, who have they been praying for? The Messiah. But everyone's read Malachi, right? They've got, or at least hopefully we're assuming that most people, I guess that's like assuming most people read their Bible in church. Like, wait, was that on the forgotten books? Yeah. Uh, So like, you know, they know the prophecy though, right? Because even in Isaiah, it says one will come from the wilderness uh, who will proclaim. So like they're the prophecy of the one that's going to come before him. So if you know the, the Savior's coming, you're also praying for the herald of the king, right? The person who's going to proclaim he's here. And that's what John is. He's the, he's the herald of it. So I really like, uh, I don't know if this in- is intentional, and I didn't do enough looking into it. It's just something that triggered in my brain 
uh, as you're reading the passage again, that um, sometimes there's the small scale view of a story where like, oh, he heard their prayers exactly. But then there's that like, let's pull back the lens a little bit. He was hearing everybody's prayers. Yeah. And that's the part that breaks my brain because that's just how life works and how God mm -hmm. weaves things through is like things do happen on that very small scale. But then what comes from any of that, you know, and he uses it all for his glory and for his purposes. Yeah. So yeah, they're like, oh, we're, we're praying for we're praying for a son. We're praying for a son. They're like, OK, I got you. It's like, but because of your faithfulness, you are blameless. Like now's the time and you're going to because somebody has to be the parents mm -hmm. of this guy. Right. So it's like, you're going to be that one. Yeah. And I don't think that we should ever do things. How would I say it? We should never try to be faithful because then God should owe us that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But unless you are faithful, you'll never have that kind of experience. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So we have the prophecy of John. Uh, he was uh, to fulfill the biblical promise of God, the promise uh, given by the prophets. Uh, he would be filled with the Spirit before birth. We're going to see that later. Um, and John would be dedicated to God as the na as uh, a Nazareth all his life. So he would live the Nazarite vow. Um, and then John would be God's prophet to present his son to the people. And I really like more of the heralding, heralding in the king mm -hmm. kind of thing of it. And then he's going to turn people back to God. And again, looking at the time, looking at the culture, it was dark. It was gloomy. You have an oppressive ruler, Rome. You also have an oppressive King Herod. And here comes hope in the midst of it, of a prophecy. The Heavenly Hearing Aids customer service team is top notch. In fact, let's look at a few calls that came in recently. Heavenly Hearing Aid, this is Gabriel. How can I help you? Yes, I was recently told I was going to have a son named John. I'm just wondering, how can I be sure of this? You know, me and my wife are old. Listen, I stand in the presence of God and translated that information clearly to your device. Since you didn't believe me, you are not going to be able to speak until he is born. Heavenly Hearing Aid, this is Gabriel. Do not be afraid, you who have found favor with God. You are going to have a son named Jesus, and he will be the Son of the Most High. How will this be? Go visit your cousin Elizabeth. She is also pregnant. This will be your sign to know I am telling you the truth. May it be to me as you have said. Heavenly Hearing Aid, this is Gabriel. How can I assist you? Me and my shepherd buddies just got a message from a host of angels and are wondering what to do. Yes, yes, I see that in our files. Just follow what they said and you will meet your savior. The Heavenly Hearing Aid, number one in customer service and providing the best help so you can hear from heaven clearly. Um, which does kind of make me want to pause for a minute because we've been talking about prophecy uh but really looking at what is prophecy because i do believe we have some sort of confusion on what prophecy is yeah well i think that just looking at prophecy um i'm taking this from the baker encyclopedia of the bible prophecy it's a term along with its english cognates prophet to prophesy prophetism and prophetic is derived from a group of Greek words in which, in pagan Greek, mean to speak forth, to proclaim, mm. to announce. In biblical Greek, however, these terms always carry the connotation of speaking, proclaiming, or announcing something under the influence of divine inspiration. Mm. So yeah, it's just like, to speak forth is to prophesy, but like, no, let's narrow that down into biblical terms, like to speak forth in terms of God giving you something to speak forth. Which you would generally look at in the Old Testament would be, thus says the Lord, mm -hmm. would kind of show, oh, this is prophecy happening right here. Yeah. You want me to, you want me to go deeper into stuff? Yeah. Okay. So, Always. <laughs> <laughs> so that's looking at like prophecy, but as we're looking at how can you have prophecy without a prophet? So we're looking at John being foretold here, like, oh, he's going to be a great prophet in the line of Elijah. And as we already mentioned, Elijah was like this prototype, not prototypical, but you know, 
the prophet of prophets if you're to look mm-hmm. back and, and to have that. So, okay, so you have these prophets who are prophesying. What kind of is that role? What does it look like? Because even in our stories in the beginning, when we're talking about, like, oh, you have any weird prophecy stories? And I'm just mm-hmm. like, I don't know, someone kind of prophesied over me that I would have a golden mouth. And like, you yeah. know, these things. And, and really, when you get into the scriptures, there is, it's pretty full. Yeah. As far as how it comes out. So if you look at what are the roles of prophets, because then that would kind of show you how prophecy comes into play. You've got uh, prophets as God's spokesmen. Mm -hmm. So as you were saying, they would herald in impending judgment. Um, They advocated repentance. They conveyed messages from God to the nations. So again, hey, I've been with God. I'm bringing this to you. Go back to Jonah, right? He's a prophet to Nineveh saying, I'm bringing this message from God to a nation. Um, They also had supernatural activities, uh, such as they revealed future events, which is probably what most of us think of when we think of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Fortune telling or future events, yeah. Yeah, things like that. Uh, They received dreams and visions. Uh, They worked miracles. So again, going back to Elijah and Elisha, his his protege, they work in all kinds of miracles going on there. Um, Prophets acted as intermediaries between God and the people and also between the people and God. That's where you would see Moses being called out as being a prophet to Mm -hmm. where very often he went and God was like, I'm done with these guys. And Moses was like, whoa, 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 boss. (laughs) If I should be so bold. Yeah. How about we don't? (laughs) Um, But yeah, it went back and forth. Like they were intermediaries between, and in that they had a responsibility as watchmen, that they were really looking at things not, that's where you'd have prophets standing outside of kind of the political sphere of things Mm -hmm. where very often they were calling out who was the king. And, you know, you have that even with uh, King David, right? Or let's tell a little story, King David. Oh, yeah. You are the man. Yeah. Yeah. Nathan the prophet. Yeah. Yeah. but then beyond that, you just had prophets being leaders in the community. Uh, you have them giving advice. You have them giving encouragement. They were leading people. Um, and then they even appointed kings and leaders, as were Samuel and Nathan, you know, things like that going mm-hmm. on. Um, and then prophets would also write. <laughs> just as far as what other roles did they <laughs> yeah, have. Yeah, I mean, that's Some how of, we... Because when we went through the books, like... Um, the Forgotten? Uh, yeah, who was it that actually, they wrote their prophecy? Which book was that? Because most of them are orators, yeah, but this yeah. guy actually was writing them. Oh, yeah. It starts off that way, too. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. But there you go. He did it. Mm-hmm. He wrote his own. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So that's just kind of when you're looking at, okay, prophecy and prophet. How's that coming in? There's a lot of different ways. But going back to that original definition that I gave, it's very much like under divine inspiration mm-hmm. doing these things. So whether it's speaking truth to power, so to speak, or of a future event or what that is, it's more that you're forth telling Here's what God has to say to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like the, you brought up some ways that they did it too. And and one of the other ones is symbolic mm-hmm. prophecy. Yeah. And, you know, you see Jeremiah does <laughs> Ezekiel. that. Ezekiel. <laughs> Running yes. around naked yeah. with little turd cakes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then uh, Hosea yeah. probably had the toughest one. Yeah. Uh, to verbally show the prophetic message of God saying like, I, I had to marry a prostitute to show what you guys are doing over and over again to God. Um, yeah, one of the things I caught with it was there's three uh, goals of the prophet, and I think you covered them somewhat, but there, it's repentance, mm-hmm. um, renewed trust or comfort in God, and then a specific action like going into battle. Um, so it does kind of make what is called prophecy and prophets today just like it almost seems like it's so much one track minded. Like everything, if if someone says they're a prophet, it's because they're telling you future things, but not like so. You're not fulfilling any of the other stuff, though. Yeah, it's yeah. not so much like. But wait, what about the rebuke? What about uh, comforting people with a, a divine word of comfort? You know, um, and and I think a lot of that is because the way it kind of changes in the New Testament, where you know in the Old Testament prophecy, uh, it slightly changes and it's categorized more as like divinely inspired speech. Um, So we have like Paul, the purpose of prophecy is exhortation and building up the church that does fall into what the original thing. uh, But Paul kind of also calls it a divine mystery. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it it kind of, I feel like anything that becomes like uh, mythical or mystical, not mythical, that would be an animal uh, or creature (laughs) or the gods type thing, uh, mystical, uh, it almost makes it seem like that's the thing people are going to be like, I do that. Because mm-hmm. it just, 
it comes with prestige. It comes with honor. And it comes with somewhat perks. I mean, Balaam is a perfect example who went and prophesied just for profit. Like he was a hired hired prophet. And he would only tell you your future if you paid the five ninety nine dollars uh, a minute type thing. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's I just wanted to throw in that with what you already had established. Yeah, and you brought a lot of the things I was talking about would probably be more familiar. Like, oh, Old Testament looking at mm-hmm. that. But in the New Testament, how you're brought in up, how you're brought in up, <laughs> how you brought up, uh, you know, how Paul would use it. Mm-hmm. But you would have uh, Peter in Second Peter 1 saying, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention to. So again, yeah. this word that's going out. But then you would also have, um, let's see, Acts 11. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them was named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the time of Claudius. Mm -hmm. So even in the New Testament times, even under this, you know, new covenant with the Holy Spirit, you still have these prophets and these prophetic Mm -hmm. events taking place. And um, going back to Paul, when he he wanted to go on that journey, and like, dude, don't go. And they, going back to the symbolic, they tied him up with belts, right? If you go, this is what's going to happen to you. So, yeah, you still had the working of it. Not everything when we talk about, oh, prophecy, it's all Elijah. <laughs> In Old Testament. I, th- yeah. I feel like for the most common belief, it's like uh, Old Testament prophecy ended in the Old Testament. Um, because you do have like Malachi and like how we talked about earlier, those uh, quiet years of God. Even in uh, First Maccabees, there's a thing that says, uh, thus there was great distress in Israel, such as had not been since the time of the prophets ceased to appear among them. So, in in a way, it almost seems that like uh, you have John kind of ushering in somewhat the next wave of these now prophetic people, which is weird because next wave. But if you look at when he's coming, Jesus isn't even born yet, right? Yeah. So just like he is an old covenant prophet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. John, yeah. It, like we done. Oh, it's in the New Testament. This is yeah, like yeah, no, yeah, he's an old yeah. covenant prophet. <laughs> yeah. Like he's straight up. He's. He's going to be out there doing it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure that as we continue to discover a savior, uh, this character, John, will keep popping up. Keep popping up, yeah. He's kind of an important guy. Yeah. And, and then, you know, obviously when there is prophets, there's always false prophets. Mm-hmm. Uh, even in Deuteronomy, there's like the test of what's a true prophet. Um, Peter, John, and uh, Paul, all throughout the New Testament, are constantly warning the church of false prophets. False prophets are coming don't believe a false prophet. Here's how you know a true one from a, uh, a false one. And what we even covered in the Didache and the Shepherd of Hermas. So as the church continues, it's the warning. So uh, I, I kind of think that whenever there's the possibility of divine communication, there's always the possibility of that being presented falsely. That's why there's so much uh, hesitancy and outright skepticism when there comes, you know, talking about prophets and prophecy. So there's the false ones that you're saying, but then... As we we're kind of leading into in the episode, prophecy is such a huge thing of discovering a savior. I know that we're coming in here with just like this prophecy related to John, and you started off before we even got into Luke and looking at that. You brought up Malachi, mm-hmm. and then hopefully people picked up that the verses that you were reading was the same thing that Gabriel had said, mm-hmm. right? He was quoting it and showing this is fulfilled prophecy that's happening right here, yeah. and that's so important. So when we're looking at prophets in general. And as we looked at John being an old covenant prophet, looking at Agabus of being a new covenant prophet. Um, But then there's even, I'm sure that we'll get into it probably in like a later episode, but you've got um, in Deuteronomy, going back to you were talking Deuteronomy, I'll pull out my own. In Deuteronomy 18, a prophecy saying, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, right? Mm -hmm. Prophet like you, meaning like Moses, I'm going to raise up another prophet. So like, that's why prophecy is so important in trying to discover saviors, because like, it was prophesied that there would be one. Right. And we want to make sure, as we're saying, well, how can we trust a prophecy? There's been many people coming and saying that they're the Messiah. There's been many people saying a lot of things. They're just like, just because it's been prophesied, hey, here's how it is. We need to then go in and look at like, okay, but how can we trust this? Yeah. 
I, I think one of the big ways, and, and then I'm going to go back into the story because yeah, yeah. It, it does kind of lead into the skepticism part. Yeah. Uh, one of the big I ways. Tr- I was trying to do that. I was uh, trying yeah. to give a good segue, Chris. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't catch it. Uh, I'll just give another one. Uh, but <laughs> Mine will be better. <laughs> <laughs> I prophesied it. <laughs> uh, but one of the things is when we are looking at prophecy, I think it does it cover those three things that we talked about. Is it uh, going to lead me back to repentance? Is it going to put renewed trust or comfort in my life towards God? And is it calling me to a specific action of change? Which then is when you look at prophecy in the Bible, everything is prophetic prophecy for the most part. I want to say somehow, some way, pointing towards Christ. Like it is pointing towards our Savior and discovering. That's why like, I loved what you said. Uh, one of the ways of discovering a Savior is discovering the prophecy that's throughout the Bible, because even if it's repentance, hey, Israel, you've turned, uh, that's prophetic of what Jesus calls us to, repent. Um, And what John would kind of lead with, uh, if it's renewed trust, like, hey, you need to come back and build this relationship or comforting, well, that's what Jesus does for us. And then a specific call to action, like, yes, we need to change our ways. We need to allow the fruit of the Spirit to alter how we we do things and correct some of the... uh, fleshly nature that we have in our lives right um can i give another good segue yeah go for it all right so given all of that even okay it was said in malachi and here you have gabriel coming and saying like i'm gonna tell you the same words Mm -hmm. you're still kind of left with okay but how can how can i believe that yeah Yeah. which i think is a good segue let's come back into the story which is crazy because that's exactly (laughs) what zachariah (laughs) says is how can i be sure of this it's like okay one i'm a prophet i'm a divine being right like i'm a divine being standing here two you know the scripture, and I just quoted it to you. And then three, I'm a divine being standing <laughs> here telling you. Remember how you were scared? <laughs> right. And then Zechariah is like, but how can I be sure of this? Because it says, how can I be sure of this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Because it's like, okay, you're telling me something that, mm-hmm. that could or should or will be true, but that's not possible, really. I've been praying yeah. for it, but you're telling me something that even though I've been praying, it's just like... uh. It ain't working, bro. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and I like even how Zachar- or Gabriel kind of starts it off with, I stand in the presence of God, right? Like that should have been the... Well, that's his response. Like, yeah. how can I trust you? So yeah. then he goes, I well, stand, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And it's like, oh, uh, but I think you're right. I, I think you caught onto something there as uh, that part that he talks about is that instead of looking at God, he looked at himself mm-hmm. and that impossibility. That I think for a lot of us, when it comes to prophecy or trusting it, uh, we don't look at God, we look inward and like how how can this be type thing well whether it's inward or just like here's what i think is true or mm-hmm. possible or whatever because mm-hmm. i know that as we're i keep saying discovering a savior because i really like that you titled this and yeah that, and i just keep drawing it back to it but when we're looking at well how can i trust prophecy and when we're saying that like well prophecy as you just said so greatly points towards jesus like well look at this prophecy it points towards i'm just like no i, I don't see how that could work right how could a virgin give birth? Right. You know what I mean? So like, therefore, I can't trust the prophecy. And just like, no, there's a thing of trusting prophecy mm-hmm. that like, if it was all just commonplace, it wouldn't need to be said. You wouldn't mm-hmm. need a divine being coming down and telling you like, here's why or how this is happening. Mm-hmm. So there, I think that there is that thing of like, yeah, sometimes in order to trust the message from God, you need to kind of have what Gabriel saying here. Like, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. So I'm needing to let you know more than what your humanity can yeah. currently know about this situation. Like one of the things being the future. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm going to tell you the future in advance as a confirmation. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I feel like it's crazy because uh, for so much of us that like we forget uh, certain things and, and you're looking at a guy who's like, he's devout. I'm not knocking Zachariah at all. I don't know how you could. And he's devout. He's a priest. He knows the law. He knows the books. He knows the stories. And here's Gabriel saying, like, you're going to have a son. And he's like, but I'm old. And I wonder in saying that, did his mind instantly go, Abraham and Sarah, <laughs> right. Rachel and Jacob, Samson's parents, um, even Hannah, you know, who was barren and mm-hmm. couldn't have kids. Like, oh, yeah, this, okay. this has been done before. The whole story is people giving birth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, in old age. But like, you know, God just coming through. Uh, but it, it does, I think that does happen. So uh, Zechariah was given a sign uh, that he will not be able to speak until John is born. That's a fun sign. Yeah. 
I read this and I thought it was cool. It said, faith opens our lips in praise while unbelief silences us. Uh, and I thought that was just a cool tie in with there. But uh, all of this to kind of just, at least for me to wrap up is like, what an honor that they would be the parents of what some may say is at the last and greatest of the prophets. I know there's some, like you mentioned, Paul, some people see him as a prophet as well. But I mean, if you're looking at anyone who's like proclaiming God's word, they're prophets, right? They're delivering a message of right, God. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. So in one hand, it's just like, it's a very broad title. Mm-hmm. But then when we think about what the prophecy is, mm-hmm. we tend to just bolt that down into being one thing. Well, I guess uh, a better way to put it, uh, one of the last old covenant prophets, like John will be the last old covenant prophet before, you know, heralding in Jesus. Uh, but it's crazy that Zechariah couldn't tell anyone this good news. Like he was just silenced into it. And, and then you look at Elizabeth who became pregnant and is now just like she isolates herself for five months. Uh, but really through it all, like when you're looking at prophecy, I, I, I think what I really want to touch on it is that uh, it's a good reminder that God regularly works through ordinary people doing normal things uh, who have a mixture of faith and devotion uh, while being ready for God to do whatever. Um, and it's like, how can I trust prophecy? I think one of the big things is, uh, when were you told? Like, how were you told? Or what are you looking at? Because for me, as I keep going through my Christian faith and doing, I find that's when God starts doing the most with me and allows me to understand more of his word and what he's saying and how I can trust uh, his prophecy. I-, I think that's the big picture I want to grasp on is, yeah, if you put the moniker of prophet before your name and you did it yourself, I'm going to say you're not a prophet. Um, because anyone who was, God was giving them that title. This is my prophet. This is my prophet. Even Amos was like, dude, I didn't grow up as a prophet. Like, this isn't even what I wanted. But God had called me out of this to do this thing. Um, so in the midst of all that, just as we go through our life, I think God uses his divine word to prophesy into us his truth about who his son is. And I think that's the thing I want to capture is like prophecy is uh, just for me uh, the truth about who God is. And I know there's other things out there and I'm, I'm not knocking or against them. I'm just saying when I'm discovering a savior, it's as I go through my life, I'm going to see God more and more and more in the bigger picture of who his son was and why he came, what the mission is, and what that impacts me. Um, we just came back from a conference yesterday. And that was a long yesterday. That was a long yesterday. It's why my voice is still kind of tired. Um, but one of the things just being there, it just it reminds me to a certain low point in my life of just not knowing what was next what was going to happen? How, you know, could God use me again? And then you had mentioned like sometimes dreams are, or prophecies are dreams and visions. Mm -hmm. And I just remembered having this dream of like kind of being a pastor again and at the church we're doing it at. And I just held on to that. I never in the midst of like my most, um, the darkest days and furthest away from God I've ever been in my life. That just, I held on to. Um, and for some reason that just kept giving me hope. And as I've grown into this more and more, what I really realized is that was the one thing that drove me back to God. It kept pointing me back to find out who this guy is, find out really who God is after all these years of serving him and who his son was and what the mission was. Uh, and it's really changed my life since. I mean, looking at it, I would say you brought up a good point about just getting into scripture. I think that how can you trust prophecy? I think that there is the double thing going on there is that there is so many recorded prophecies in the scripture that we should go and study and to see, which the gospel of Matthew is fantastic about it because it's just like, as it was written in the scriptures, as it was written in the scriptures, as it was written in the scriptures, and the New Testament authors were very aware that the New Testament and Jesus wasn't just popping up out of nowhere. It's just like for them, it was important to know that like this was legit. They're not going to go to their deaths. I mean, obviously they'd witnessed a bunch of miracles and then the biggest one, Jesus resurrection, but it's just like, even beyond that, like 
they were seeing the fulfillment of prophecy mm-hmm. taking place, and they wrote that down. So whether you're looking through the Gospels to see how Jesus was doing it, get into the book of Hebrews to see how all that played out between the covenants and what things were meaning, right? There's just so much about in the New Testament to show, like, yes, the prophecy can be trusted, and here's how to understand it and to come to that. So on the one hand, I think that when, like, how to trust prophecy, there's that kind of prophecy of, like, things that have already been recorded. that are just like, all right, well, now we just need to make sense of that. Yeah. It's not like some dude on YouTube coming up and saying a thing. <laughs> to no but then that's yeah. where I, I would bring it to on that point of like think about how much history has happened in humanity and think about relatively how small your bible is mm-hmm. and think about relatively how much of that or not much of that is a prophet giving prophecy right right yeah and just like i don't think that there is so much of our life that we should be going around trying to find prophecy in our life mm-hmm. or like not to discount because i know that in the scripture it says like hey don't like knock prophecy like test like test it and desire the good things and everything But I think that there's enough that's been given to us in a general sense that just kind of like Zechariah, if you're just being faithful, doing your thing, you kind of don't need to be sussing out like, yeah, is all of this a sign from God? What is this pointing towards? What is just like, just wake up and be faithful, bro. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And like, God will make it very apparent when it's a real prophecy. That's such a good point to just for like what we're at in life i mean the war in israel ukraine and all the other things and there's so many people out there going like prophecy this and this and that and he's it doesn't change what we're called to yeah just be faithful like yeah there's a war in israel what do we do be faithful yeah the mission didn't change no matter what circumstances are going on the mission didn't change so like yeah if it's a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled Mm -hmm. it's always going to be fulfilled fulfilled, yeah so what now you're a different christian because it might be fulfilled this week yeah Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. That's a really good point. I mean, unless it's God using circumstances and things to specifically speak to you, Mm -hmm. because you need, as you you were talking about in what makes a prophecy and that call to action part, because if there's something that's like God needs to use you, just like he was raising up John to be the Elijah Mm -hmm. to come come before, and there's been many people. I mean, look at Christian history. Like, look at the saints. Look at, like where we come from like there have been people used in amazing ways to transform nations to have like just mind-blowing things happen god things happen right but when it comes down to it i think that that question about how can i trust this and he straight up asked gabriel like how how can i trust this Mm -hmm. and he's like i'm gabriel i stand in the presence of god if god is wanting to let you know something god is far beyond able to let you know right and you brought up different people like gideon right Mm mm-hmm Like, even Gideon is like, all right, you're kind of telling me to go and do something kind of crazy right now. Yeah. I'm like, I'm from the least of the tribes, and I'm like the least of the dudes in the least of the tribes. And you're telling me to just go start knocking over all of, like, the false gods, like, temples and stuff, Mm -hmm. and then go to war? Uh, I really need to know if this is you before I go do something stupid. Because, yeah, there is so many false prophets, and there is so many things out there that we're just like, and sometimes we can just get an idea in our head and think that it's God. Yeah. So there is something. What did Gideon do? Say, God, look, I'm going to lay out this. Like, I need to find some way that you can further communicate to me that this is your truth. And mm-hmm. guess what? God communicated to him. And he goes, all right, but can you do it again? Because I need to be <laughs> double, double sure. Yeah. So I think that it's a good thing that like, if you have been given a prophecy from someone, like we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier, people prophesying over us, or you feel like you're receiving something from God. Like one, you can easily test it against scripture because if it's not going with that, it's immediately knocked, right? But then go to God. If he's the one that gave you the message, he wants to give you further instruction about the thing. And I think that brings up a good point. It's uh, how do I trust prophecy? Maybe it's not trusting God, (laughs) trusting really the the words, but it's looking at how can I trust this person? Because when we look at uh, a prophet, that message has already gone inside them and changed their lives. Like that's always the test of a true prophet and false prophet is how are they living? So here you have Gabriel and his thing is like, I stand in the presence of God. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good resume. Uh, (laughs) um, Zachariah is like, well, I'm blameless. (laughs) Yeah. And then like, you know, when you got John, like he eats the scroll or who was it? Isaiah who eats the scroll. And really what that's saying is like, it's the, the message of what he's about to say has already gone in their lives. It's been digested. It's been in them. It's metabolized and it's changed uh, who Isaiah was. So that way when he went out and gave the message, there was no, but what about his character? 
and with false prophets uh, really today, yeah, that's what you're going to see is, well, what about their character? So uh, prophecy, we're covering it. See, I told you you weren't done. I knew I was going to get you back in with some of yeah, that stuff. Yeah, but I am because I'm going to kick it back to you to say, well, what are we going to look at next week? So you're asking me to prophesy. Yes. <laughs> Not just look at our show notes <laughs> and what we have planned notes, out. Yes. Well, I don't know. I feel like we, we covered some stuff, but I feel like the question really is like, no, nah, but how can we really trust prophecy? Yeah, like seriously, can we do <laughs> no, like seriously, can we trust prophecy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I do think that we kind of need to have a follow up to this because I feel like we laid some good groundwork and there's kind of some bigger things because we're on discovering a savior. So we yeah. looked at some stuff here that ties into, but I think next time if we look at some like messianic prophecy and really get in there because that's really where it matters. Like, Because maybe say, okay, I can trust prophecy. I can even trust biblical prophecy. But how can I trust that this guy is the one that's fulfilling it? Mm -hmm. So I think that some of that and maybe start off right at the beginning with, uh, well, who is this guy? Yeah. All right. So I'm Chris. I'm Yurda. We are your church friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, thank you very much for listening to this episode. If you have any questions, need prayer, or want to share your thoughts about the show, you can email us at yourchurchfriends at gmail.com. We would really love to hear from you. And if you're on Facebook, take a moment to join our group page so that you can stay up to date with what's going on with the podcast and join any discussion about our latest episodes. Also, do us a favor and follow and subscribe to the show on whatever podcasting platform you listen to, and then leave a review and ratings. Most importantly, share this with a friend. They will thank you for it, and so will we. And finally, be sure to go check out the Christian Podcasters Association Network for other quality Christian podcasts. Don't forget to check out our website, yourchurchfriends.rocks. Again, that website is yourchurchfriends.rocks, because we rocks.